Every Heart Cry conference, people always ask us, they go, well, the conference is all about theology and teaching. Uh, but you never give a report on the mission. So we've decided a bit to change to change that and, and to present a PowerPoint. Is it up here somewhere? There we go. We're going to have a PowerPoint presentation regarding the Heart Cry Missionary Society. What we do at Heart Cry is support indigenous missionaries throughout the world in about 15 different countries. Now, the reason that we do missions is not primarily for man, even though we have a great burden for men. It is not our primary reason for doing missions. The primary reason for doing missions is the glory of God, that his name might be great among the nations and that the lamb might receive the full reward of his suffering. It is for God primarily. Never forget that the first and greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So as it is in missions, the priority is God. Let's go to the next slide there about our ministry. Let's see. There we go. All right. We do several different things at Heart Cry, and there's six distinct ministries within our society. One is indigenous missionary training, the other theological training, Bible distribution, literature distribution, evangelistic tools and church construction. And we're going to look at each one of those just for a moment. Look at indigenous missions. Indigenous means that someone is native to a certain country. Now, how did we get started doing this? As I was working in Peru, even though I knew many uh, very, very worthy North American missionaries, I also met many, many indigenous missionaries, men who had started 10, 15, 20, even 75 churches. And yet they had uh, they lived on seventy five dollars a month. And I began to work with these men and the idea came to not to start a mission organization that would send North Americans to other countries, but to support to start a mission organization that would support indigenous missionaries in their own country. Now, why indigenous missionaries? Um, first of all, it's a wise use of human resources. The world is a very large place. It has over six a billion people. If every Christian in North America were to become a missionary, there still would not be enough missionaries to reach the world. And so if we're going to reach the world, we're not going to do it through just traditional means of missions. We need to get behind the great number of people that God is raising up. Also, fact number two, it is a wise use of financial resources. It can take up to and even more than four thousand dollars a month to support a North American missionary on a field where the average salary of a person who lives there is two hundred dollars a month. That's just a fact. It's just a fact. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, when we began to work in Moldova to support a North American missionary, there would cost three to four thousand dollars a month. The average salary of a doctor in Moldova was seventy five dollars a month. So we supported two Moldavian missionaries and sent them to two different places in Moldova. Their salaries were one hundred dollars apiece. In one year, each church where they had been sent doubled in size and one mission started one church started three mission points and the other church started two mission points. And it was twenty four hundred dollars for the entire year. Another reason by supporting indigenous missionaries, fact number three, it eliminates language and cultural barriers. It often takes it often takes a North American missionary the first four years or five years of his term just to be able to begin to speak the language. And so you have spent over a quarter of a million dollars for the first five years, and yet a church has not even begun to be planted. Now, let me say this. Sometimes that is necessary. We are not saying that there ought to be a moratorium on North American missions. Not at all. We need more North American missionaries than ever. But what we are saying is there are great reasons for supporting indigenous missionaries. They do not have to learn the language 
they do not have to learn the culture from the very first day that they're supported. They can begin evangelizing the lost and planting churches. Another reason it eliminates political barriers, political barriers. There are some places in the world where we are hated, where a North American is absolutely hated. And if he goes into that country to preach the gospel, the gospel won't be rejected because of the gospel. The gospel won't even be heard because the missionary will be rejected because of his politics, because of his flag. But when you support an indigenous missionary, uh, that barrier is overcome. Also, it eliminates economic barriers, something that is very, very important. Most North American missionaries do not live like the people to whom they're sent. Some do, but most do not. Um, and let me just read what we have here. I want to make sure I get every word of this. The standard of living of most missionaries from the West far exceeds that of the people to whom they minister. Their homes often seem like mansions in comparison to the norm. They drive cars while the native takes a bus. They send their children to private school while the native sends his to public school. In contrast, the indigenous missionary avoids this problem and that his support is adjusted according to the average salary for his own country. He lives in the same neighborhood, takes the same bus and his children attend the same school. There's another reason it eliminates difficult transitions. Most North American missionaries will tell you that when they go off on furlough for a year, many times the church they have planted drops by about 40 to 50 percent in attendance. Also, the greatest problem on the mission field when a North American missionary plants a church is that eventually that church needs to be turned over to an indigenous or a national pastor. Many times when that occurs, uh, many people that are members of the church simply leave. We call them rice Christians. They were never there for the sake of the gospel to begin with. They were there because of the prestige of having a foreign or a North American missionary as a pastor. When you begin a church with an indigenous missionary, you don't have rice Christians. They don't come there because it's an American preaching. They come there because of what is being preached. Now, when I... Uh, began to work in Peru, uh, went there with zeal and, and, you know, I was young. I was only 25 or 26 years old when I was went to be a full time missionary in Peru. And like most missionaries, I went there thinking that I would plant this big, humongous church that would be a model for all the Peruvian churches who really did not know how to do it. And that's kind of the way a lot of people go to the mission field. And well, by God's grace, we did plant a church, planted several other churches. But I began to see something very, very important. I saw indigenous pastors there who, although they did not have the training I had and definitely had nothing else, no library, no books. Yet they had planted many, many churches. My third year in Peru, they were having a large Baptist Bible conference in the city of Lima, and a man by the name of Angel Comenares was invited to that conference. And since they, the, the pastors cannot afford hotels or anything, we all put them up in our homes. And Angel Comenares came to stay with me. It was one of the most exciting days of my life. I couldn't wait to meet this man because I heard that he was one of the greatest church planters alive. And he came, and here's this little humble man. I remember he was sleeping on a on a bag there on the floor, on the second floor of our church with a bunch of other men. He was laying down talking and I walked in and um, I was young. I was 26 or 27 years old and um, I was young. And when I walked in, he looked up at me and he said, are you Pastor Paul Washer's son? And I said, no, I'm Pastor Paul Washer. And I'll never forget. He jumped up out of the sack. And he. He bowed like this and he said, Pastor, I am so sorry. I am so ashamed. At that point in time, that man, that little man had planted 75 churches. Now God has used him through a movement in the north that has over 600 churches. 
Um, I remember one time Ruben Bonilla was a filmmaker in Peru and he had was supposed to go to Brazil to attend the what was considered to be the greatest mission conference in the history of South America. But I told him, I said, Ruben, I said, I'm going to the mountains where Pastor Angel is going to have a convocation of churches. Would you please go with me and film where I'm going to take you instead of going to the greatest conference? And he said, I finally convinced him. Well, before we left the coast up into the mountains, uh, we were at Brother Colmenatis' little house, which was you wouldn't have parked your car in it. Um, it just a shack of a place. And Brother Colmenatis said, we can't leave right now because I need to find a, a battery, a car battery for my microphone so I can preach when we get to the mountains. And so we went out to a garbage dump and he was looking around for a battery. And that filmmaker looked at me and he goes, you know what? He goes, I was supposed to be in Brazil where all the great mission experts of the world are going to be gathered together, all the great mission professors. But instead, I'm walking around a dump looking for a battery with a little man who has started more churches than all those experts put together. And um, so that is. Uh, we support indigenous missionaries. Now, another thing that we do is theological training. Let me share with you something. The greatest need on the mission field. Is for people to be able to teach. The Bible. To teach about God, to teach theology, to teach systematic theology, to teach expository preaching. You would not believe that if you were to take all the billions of dollars spent in missions, you would find that only a tiny single digit portion of that is actually spent on church planters and teaching truth. I had a young man call me several years ago while I was in Peru and he said, Brother Washer, I want to come down to Peru. I just want to give my life away down there. I just want to come and work with you. I want to give my life away. I said, how are you in, in, in your studies? How many hours a day do you study the word of God? He said, well, that's not really my strong point. I said, well, how are you in intercessory prayer? How many hours a day do you pray? He said, well, that's not. He said, I just want to give my life away. And I said, young man, there's nobody in Peru who needs your life. They need God. And if you're going to come down here as a missionary, you need to be able to open up your mouth and tell them about God. There's so much romanticism, especially on college and seminary campuses. But I want to be a missionary. Why? Missionary is missions is not about sending missionaries. Missions is about sending truth. God's truth, God's gospel. Today, it seems that the great and it's and not just seems it's true. The great portion. I would dare say 90 percent of all mission giving has nothing to do with theology. Missionaries are by and large a theological. They don't care that much about theology. And yet the church that they're going to plant it's going to be a church that's going to affect the theology of all the other churches that spring forth from it. And then all the trends in the United States that have destroyed. Like easy believism, decisionism, and especially all this new church growth stuff. Is being now carried abroad. By missionaries. And so one of the greatest needs on the mission field is to teach theology, to teach truth, to teach men how to correctly interpret the Bible. You see, you can have all kinds of conferences, but if you have a thousand conferences, you're still not going to be able to give those men everything they need. But if you teach them how to interpret the Bible and you convince them that in that Bible, they'll find everything they'll need, then they'll have every answer to every question all the days of their life. And so more and more heart cries seeking to move into the realm of theology and teaching theology and and translating books and getting things out there to start theological training by extension and so many other things. Now, one of the things we do at heart cry is Bible conferences. 
We, we hold conferences in different places in the world and we we call together, we pray and call together pastors, primarily pastors, sometimes seminary professors also, but primarily pastors who are who are pastors serious about truth. Serious about preaching truth, men who stay in the word and see it as their their most important obligation to teach truth. And we take them with us and they teach. Eventually, some of the men teach so much over there and become so well known over there, they no longer even need to go with us. But we have conferences and men will come to these conferences and we actually have to limit the number of people. Because if we were to open it up to absolutely everyone, we would have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. The need is that great. The need is that great. Then we also theological education by extension. In the last year, God has blessed Heart Cry with more staff and it was so necessary. We were supporting. About two years ago, we were supporting almost 90 missionaries. In 16 countries on four continents, um, doing a lot of other things. And it was three of us in the States working in a 15 by 18 foot office filled with computers. I'll never forget someone called us on the phone and they said, you know, we would we've heard about the ministry. We would like to come and visit the Heart Cry campus. And I'll never forget, you know, Darren, who was working with us at the time, put his hand over the phone and said, hey, Paul, somebody wants to come here and visit the heart cry campus. (laughs) And I told Darren, I said, well, do you think we can buy a golf cart so we'll be able to take them all around? (laughs) In this last year, God has um, the the church here at, at Muscle Shoals has provided Offices for us pay all the utilities because we never wanted to take the money that people donate to heart cry and put it into big buildings. But God has provided us all the space, all the offices, everything we need free of charge, along with the utilities and everything else. And it's from the people at First Baptist Church of Muscle Shoals. But not only that, um, we are brought one staff on. Um who has taken the place of our good friend, uh, Darren Rotman, who left us last year. God called him into other things. And he's some of, you know, Darren, and he is so wonderfully right smack dab in the middle of God's will. And and uh, but God sent us Matt Glass, who uh, is working with us now. Then there was a young man on staff at First Baptist Church of Muscle Shoals who is involved in missions and First Baptist gave him to us. And so he is working with us full time, but supported by all the brothers here. And then another dear brother came on full time, retired early from his work and has come on as volunteer, but at the same time works full time. And um, so God has finally given us staff so that I can give myself literally to the thing I've been wanting to do for years, but unable to do. And that is theological education by extension. And that is, you see, there's a reformation going on in this country of people returning to the old ways, pastors and men. And, and what what my desire is, is, is here's the thing that has happened. You've had all these organizations, whether they be the fire or fellowship or founders conference fellowship, but fellowships of churches that seek to promote the, the historic truths of Christianity. But no mission organization has raised up, has been raised up to parallel that. And I see all these hundreds and hundreds of pastors who are serious about truth who love the Lord. And my desire is to help form teams so that these men can go to different places in the world and teach. You'll never believe what one module can do to a group of pastors. Four pastors from the United States going overseas and literally pouring theology, pouring truth, pouring Bible into men for 10 days. The impact it has on their life. 
Plus, there is a great need. Do you realize in China, China, how long has the work been going on? There's not one systematic theology in Chinese. I mean, there's so much that's just lacking because it seems that missions is all about romanticism. It's all about evangelism, but it's not about truth. And we have got to get into these countries and we have got to get them truth. Bibles and sound literature and concordances and Bible dictionaries and things that they can use to do the truth. You can't keep a mission movement going just based on experience. Even when it's supernatural experience, it must still be founded upon the word of God. And so we're going to be working in that. Another thing is Bible distribution. Uh, We do not give away Bibles to lost people. Many people did that in Russia and the Russian army would send all their men in in plain clothes to gather up all the Bibles that were being handed out. And then they would use it for toilet paper. But we go into places where believers have no Bibles. There are places where we work, where if a pastor wants to go to another uh, village in the mountains to preach the gospel, he has to ask permission from his church to take the church Bible. And so getting Bibles in the hands of believers and it's in you could do it cheaply. You could do it with paperback Bibles and such like that. But it's worthless. Why? Because most of them are in the jungle and mountains and the paperback Bibles come unglued in a day. And so we invest in hardback Bibles that are sewn together and that have concordances. Also, not just the New Testament, because the Bible also has an old one. And so. It is to distribute Bibles is very important. Also, God has uh, greatly gifted the church in the sense that in recent years, Dr. MacArthur's study Bible has been translated into different languages. Now, to you, that might seem, oh, a study Bible. That's nice. I have given out. Bibles like that. Or a. One volume commentary. And had pastors of many years kiss my hands. Kiss my hands. And giving out Bibles, literature. You know, that literature table back there is of, whoa, look at those books. If Romania had even the, a tenth of the books that are on just that table. It would be miraculous. You see, I'll never forget. I had flown into Peru and uh, some people had given me money to buy pastoral libraries. And I flew into Peru and got there real late and uh, about got to my sleeping quarters at about two in the morning after going through customs and everything. But something just I couldn't sleep. I had to go to the bookstore the next day. And I didn't know why. Why should I go to the bookstore in Lima? But I just knew I just couldn't even say I've got to go to the bookstore tomorrow. Well, you've got several days. We could do that later. No, I've got to go now. And remember, I, I took a taxi there and got there too early and the doors weren't even open. It's the one good bookstore there in, in, in Peru. And I, I walk in and I, I walk near the store and I see this little man. And I could tell he was from the jungles of San Martin because I had worked there before. And I see him sitting there on the curb, kind of looking around. And I sat down beside him. I said, uh, como estas? You know, what, what's going on? Where are you from? And he started telling me. We started talking about places I'd been, where he'd been. And, and I said, what, what are you doing all the way in Lima? He said, well, it took me three days to get here. Back of trucks, buses. And I said, well, what are you doing here? He goes, I'm pastoring. I've become a pastor. And he goes, My church gathered up some money for me to come buy some books. And when he said that, my heart just broke because I knew the money they gave him wasn't enough to buy a track in that store. So I sat there and I said, oh, that's good. And um, so the door finally opened and we went in and I went in and I just started. I knew what pastoral libraries I needed to buy and things I needed to get for poor pastors. So I'm just keeping it all up in piles and going along. And I think I got two guys helping me there in the store, get all the books together. And I watched that man out of the corner of my eye and he'd go to one bookshelf 
And you'd see him look. He'd go to another. And then finally, he went to this little place where they sold chick tracks. And I saw him pick out about four. And just to look at his face, you know, and he walks up to the counter. It was like the greatest day of my life. He walks up to the counter. He bought them. He's just kind of standing there. And I walked over to him. I said, hey, how's it going? You know, he said, didn't even say anything. He was just broke. And I said, what books did you get? He goes, I, I didn't get any, I didn't get any books. <laughs> and I said, I said, do you know where I'm from? He said, no, I said, I'm from the United States. You know how far away that is? He said, no. I said, about, about 6,000 miles. I said, do you know how much my plane ticket cost? And he was like looking at me like, why are you saying this to me? I said, do you know how much my plane ticket cost? He said, no. I said, about $800. Do you know when I got here? He said, no. I said, two this morning. Do you know I couldn't sleep? And he said, no, I, I, I didn't know you couldn't sleep. <laughs> and I said, do you know why? He said, why? Now you're looking at a man that if he held five dollars in his hand, he wouldn't know what to do. I said a few months ago. God. Raised up a group of people in the United States. And they gave me money. And then I bought a plane ticket for eight hundred dollars. And I flew in a plane here and I landed here last night. All the way from the United States. And I couldn't sleep all night. And so I got in a taxi this morning and I made my way down here. Do you know why? He said, no. Because to buy you every book you're ever going to need. I said, do you, real, do you realize the love of God? I love that because if God loves him that much, he loves me that much. He loves you that much. Just think about that. God moved people from an entirely different nation. God spent all kinds of money, bought a plane ticket for one reason. A little Indian in the middle of the jungle. And if you say coincidence, you're a blasphemer and a fool. God did that for him. Isn't that wonderful? We got we got such a good God, we got a wonderful God. Just got a wonderful God, and and that's what missions is about. We're always thinking about. It seems like we go to the mission field, and we jump completely over the church to do our own thing with the lost. You ever realize that? I see missionaries and mission groups doing this all the time. Jump right over the church to go do something with the lost. My thing is the bride of Christ. If we help the bride become beautiful and strong in those countries, she'll take care of the lost. She'll take care of the lost. We need to pour our lives into the church. Because that's the only place God's determined to get glory for himself. We also evangelistic tools. We have bought. 40 horse Yamahas for the Amazon and Marignon rivers, lumber to build boats, uh, pecky pecky engines for canoes. A pecky pecky engine is a Briggs and Stratton engine with a long shaft on the end and a propeller. They're called Pecky Pecky. The only reason we can figure out why they're called Pecky Pecky is because the first time an Indian heard one coming down the river, he goes, oh, look, Pecky 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 Pecky, because that's the sound they make. <laughs> we buy bicycles and motor scooters and donkeys and mules. Hermano Heraclito, so a dear brother in Peru. And uh, I first met him in, some, in, uh, in Turmancito. 
and um, he's highly honored by all the, the, the countless mountain men up there who are Christians. He walks kind of like this. He's all arthritic and his feet and his back and everything. And, and he would go six hours on Wednesday night to preach at a fellowship, a prayer meeting, and then walk six hours back. So we bought him a mule, made things a whole lot easier. And then after I bought him a mule, about three years later, he, he wore the mule out. The mule died. So we had to buy him. A, we bought him another mule. And so we'll do evangelistic tools like that. And uh, things that they need in order to get up and down. We also do church construction, not a whole lot. But when we do, we pride ourselves in building the ugliest church buildings on the face of the earth. What we do is we um, we don't want to give anything away. So, first of all, we don't work with a group of people that aren't tithing and giving. If they're tithing and giving, usually they're taking all their money just to rent a building for space. So that's a catch 22. They spend all their money renting their building. They can't save. So we will buy a piece of land and help them build a building that is just most of the time. It doesn't even have a cement floor. It's just enough to keep the rain, the wind and the dark off of them with light bulbs screwed in everywhere. And that's about it. Get them inside a building and then they can take that building the rest of the way and do the things that God would want them to do to improve it. We support people. We're going to kind of go through this kind of fast. We first of all, we support works in Peru. That's where we began. And then also we're working in the country of Israel. And um, I, are there some slides on this? There's Peru. OK, we're working in in Israel and uh, with two dear brothers who suffer greatly from persecution. Anthony uh, Simon is right now a possibility that he's going to be booted out of Israel because he's so evangelistic. And since he's a Jew and a, and a citizen there, there's a debate whether or not you can be a Jew and be a Christian at the same time. And if you go into different places of Jerusalem, you'll actually see wanted posters with his face on it. And they've been made up by the Orthodox Jews and the wanted posters say this man is an enemy of Israel, an enemy of the state. Avoid him at all cost. We also have another man, Leonid Banchik, who uh, who works in Tel Aviv. And two months ago, he was uh, dragged out of his car and beaten up severely and put in the hospital by Orthodox Jews because he was preaching the gospel. The next country we work in Benin. Um, we'll be working there just to the end of this year. Most of the men that we've worked with in West Africa are now pastoring the churches that uh, that uh, that they were planting. And so we don't want to support pastors. We support missionaries who are planting churches. But once they pastor the church and the church is established and autonomous then the church takes the job over. OK, Ghana is the same way. West Africa, Nigeria. And then uh, this is one of the most interesting uh, mission works that we're a part of. Um, about 25, 30 years ago, God saved about four different men. And uh, in Zambia, through a Bible league or something like that, and they grew phenomenally. And one of the leaders uh, is a man by the name of Conrad Mbewe. And uh, the banner of truth refers to him as the African Spurgeon or the Black Spurgeon. And uh, I know him. He's a friend of mine. And the title is worthy. Some of the greatest preaching and preachers I've ever heard. I've heard in Zambia between him, Ronald Kaufungwe and others. It's a mission movement like in, unlike any other. I was there at the conference last year. About 700 men gathered together with their families at the, the Bible conference. And I'll never forget there were these teenagers arguing at a table. About eight or nine, I don't know how many teenagers, and they were arguing. You could tell it was a heated debate. Now, if that was the United States of America, they're arguing over what's the best PlayStation or whatever, uh, you know, Game Boy or who won the World Series. I go over there and I'm thinking, what are they arguing about? The argument between these teenagers was infralapsarianism as opposed to superlapsarianism. Some of you are saying, what kind of dinosaur is that? The point is, theologically, these people are just so on track, such high theology. It's all the early Baptist Puritans, uh, Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Just amazing. 
But at the same time, with an evangelistic zeal that goes beyond anything there, they know that Europe is not going to come south to win the Muslim world. So they believe it's the southern Africans task to take the gospel to the Muslim world. And I said, you know, you do that, you'll die. You know that, don't you? And they said, well, of course. Of course, you'll die. Of course, you will. So we work in Zambia. Also, brother uh, Matt Glass, who read a letter yesterday, he and, and Dr. Barry are specifically targeting their great burden is directed mostly towards the 1040 window. And several years ago, had the privilege of begin to work with uh, James Dolly, who's in Imphal City, India, and they're training missionaries at the Grace Himalayan Mission. They're training missionaries and sending them out to all different parts of the 1040 window. Their vision is absolutely astounding. But what's more astounding is this. Although a lot of people have big visions, few people actually move towards seeing them fulfilled. These men and women are are under persecution in the next heart cry newsletter. As a matter of fact, we will have several stories of how many of them have suffered greatly. Even some have been martyred, but they just keep going, keep going, keep going. And so one of those places where they work is Burma and we're supporting men there. India, of course, China is is a frontier that I, I was just in a missions conference in, in Detroit and I came across a wonderful North American missionary couple who are headed to China and the things that they told me, the needs that are there, pastors, you know, we always hear this thing. Well, there's 80 million Christians. Well, there may be, but there's almost no Bible training. And the need to go in there and to teach the Bible, to teach the Bible. And so also we're supporting a, a man in Siberia in a few days. Our dear Romanian director, Sorin Prodan, and our Ukrainian director, Dion Giriada, are going to be going to Siberia to visit uh, this uh, this work. And we're hoping to come into contact with several other men. It's up in the Jamal Peninsula. Very, very cold. I have several testimonies of people who were baptized in the dead of winter in Siberia. Most of us would have said, you know, we really need to go through a membership class first, don't you think? <laughs> Maybe that's where it got started. All right. In the Ukraine. Again, uh, this brother here uh, in the Ukraine, Ilya Rusniak, is, is a wonderful, wonderful brother who actually worked in Siberia for many years. And the very prison where Christians were held captive. He helped start a church. It's no longer a prison. It's a church. God just loves to do things like that, doesn't he? All right. And also in, in Moldova, a great need there. They're kind of against Americans. So it's really good to to work with uh, using Moldavian missionaries on Romania is after Peru. The first spot that we went where the Lord laid upon my heart to begin. This also was Romania. And God has done a tremendous work in that he raised up uh, one young man. Uh, actually, when we hired him, he was only like 22 years old. Because we told the I told the president of the Romanian Baptist that we would not work in Romania unless there was someone that would be a great director and other churches would come in and there would be accountability and things. And he led me to this one young man, 22 years old. And I said, there's no way he's a boy. He said, trust me, just take the guy on for a while. And we did. And uh, now the, the boy's almost, I guess, 30. And uh, God has used him. To, it, it's just phenomenal. Churches in Romania, in uh, Moldova, in Ukraine, in in Serbia, uh, and all through the work that God's been doing through this young man. Uh, let's go on the next country. We work among the gypsies. They are a wild people. And God loves working with a people like that. It is very, very special. Um, in one of the places with the gypsies, one of the places where actually the Romanian communist government had de determined a valley where they would send all the gypsies and exterminate them. Something happened and the orders got mixed up and it never happened. And in that very spot is the largest gypsy church in Europe. And um, 
it is a wonder to work there. We work through a man by the name of Moses Marin, and he is a very, very special man, very special man. He's kind of the um, unofficial leader of everything uh, among the gypsy Christians in Romania. OK, let's go on to the next. We work in Serbia and um, this is a very, very difficult place to work. But we have a missionary there, Zoran and his family, and they're doing a wonderful job. They've planted a church and the church is growing and we're looking forward, hopefully, to getting another man to work with him. What we're doing in Europe is that we're not sending out missionaries by themselves, but we're sending out missionary teams. OK, go on. And then let's look at some of our convictions just really quick. And um, I believe it or not, my eyes are so bad, I can't even see that up there. So I hope that they're written on this paper here, because if they're not, I won't be able to read it. Um, first of all, our first conviction is the chief end of all mission work is the glory of God. Our greatest passion is that his name be great among the nations from the rising to the setting of the sun. We find our constant. We find our. Uh, Great purpose and constant motivation, not in man or his needs, but in God, his commitment to his own glory and our God given desire to see him glorified in every nation, tribe, people and language. Secondly, we recognize that the needs of mankind are many and his sufferings are diverse. We believe that they all spring from a common origin, the fall of man and the corruption of his own heart. Therefore, we believe that the greatest benefit to mankind can be accomplished through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the establishment of biblical churches. Third conviction, every need of this ministry will be met through prayer. Now, I want to address this for a moment. After rereading and studying George Mueller and listening to some some teaching on George Mueller by Dr. Piper, we realized that we were even more extreme than George Mueller. And we have come to certain biblical convictions. We believe more biblical about our needs. We will not raise funds. We will not. We will not prod or manipulate our brothers. We'll not stand before them and tell them that if they do not give people on the foreign field will be hurting and God's plan will fail. We will not manipulate or prod our brothers. But if we are asked about certain things, we will share that. We will share that. Also, we have decided many people over the years have even become angry with me. They've said, you know, Paul, it's not about you. You represent a bunch of people around the world who have legitimate needs. And some of us would so like to give, but you never will tell us how. If we knew a legitimate need somewhere overseas with a missionary, if we just knew about it, we would we would gladly do something about it. And so what we've decided to do is this. That not right now, but in time on our website, we are going to have a place where someone can click on it if they want. They can click on it. And when they do, it will be needs that have been handed to us from Siberians and Serbians and Nigerians or Zambians or whatever. Valid needs that we have validated with our own men. And we know their real needs of what it is and what someone can do if they so desire. It will not be on our front page. It will not be something meant to prod people, but it will allow people to go to our website and say, you know, there's something I would like to do. I know I can do that. And we feel like that is that that's what the Lord would have us to do. And uh, but we're, we still want to zealously guard the fact that it is God who has done this. You see, it's so easy to determine whether something's God's will or not when you don't raise funds. Because if you think it's God's will and he doesn't give you the money, guess what? You were wrong. So it's real easy to determine what you should be doing or should not be doing. But if you think something is God's will and then you prod and manipulate God's people to give you money, you could be totally out of the will of God and actually taking God's money and using it for the wrong reasons. We don't ever want to be guilty of that. Next, fourth conviction, we never intend to enlarge our field of labor by contact by contracting debt. 
If we have the money, we do it. If you don't have the money, don't do it. I think a lot of Americans would do well to learn that truth. Um, fifth conviction, those employed full time at this ministry should be afforded uh, that which is required to live with dignity, to neglect their welfare would give excuse for the ungodly to bring unjust accusations against the Lord that he is either uncaring or unable to meet the needs of those he employs. To the same degree, those who are supported shall not be given so much as to waste the Lord's resources, acquire luxury or live above those who so graciously give to the Lord's work. To seek wealth and luxury in the ministry is to deny the call. Sixth conviction that those in meeting any need, those of us who are supported financially by this ministry will be the first to sacrifice what is necessary. Seventh conviction. Our goal is not to enlarge ourselves. Now, the point of this is simply this. It's not our goal to be big. Listen, heart cry could disappear tomorrow off the face of the earth. I'm sorry, it's just not that important that God's work is somehow going to be hindered. God is so much bigger than us. We do not have to exist. We do not have to grow. We do not have to get bigger. God's kingdom does not depend upon us. So our only requirement, the only thing we have to concern ourselves with is doing the will of God. That's it. Just do what God has told us to do. If he, he wants us to grow and to be part of more countries, praise the Lord that we might have the faith to go through those doors. If he wants us to stay exactly where we're at, then we should do so. It is only about the will of God. You see, God does not need anyone, but he does desire that we be obedient. And um, working together, we recognize something that is so important. And it is this. We at Heart Cry and our work were nothing more than just little messenger boys. There have been people that have been a part of this ministry and some of you are here. And it has been through your sacrificial giving and your prayers. The only thing we've done is taken what you've given and taken it overseas. And we greatly appreciate you and and realize again that heart cry is wasn't built on us. It was built on your kindness and your love for God's work. Now, some of you might this might be the first time you've heard a heart cry and you think, man, I would really love to give to that organization. You need to understand something. First of all, we're not an organization. We have specifically put ourselves under a local church. We are not a parachurch organization. We exist as part of a church. Secondly, before you give, if you're not if you're not giving biblically to your local church, don't even think about giving to somebody like us. I actually we had someone who wrote us and said, you know, I don't like my church. I'm going to send my tithe to you. And we had to write him back and say, we really appreciate it. But biblically, we can't accept that. So. That another thing, even if you are giving biblically and even if what you hear today, you know, excites you, that doesn't mean you're supposed to give the heart cry. I would never want you to give to this ministry against God's will. You need to pray. You need to ask God. It's not your money. God may want you to give to some. God does want you involved in the Great Commission. God does want you giving sacrificially to the Great Commission, but maybe not here. You need to be involved in what God wants you to be involved in. Do you see that? It's very important. We do not need what God does not want you to give. So you need to pray and investigate other mission organizations and local ministries here in the States, because there might be one of those that God wants you to care for, because there are many, many worthy ministers and ministries. So pray, just pray. OK, how much time are we out of time? Are we out of time? Where's Nathan Barry when I need him? There he is. How long can I go? Can I preach something? All right.
through that. All right. Open the Bible to the Song of Solomon. And I, I got a late start. I was looking at the clock. You cheated me with about 15 minutes. So I got a late start. Song of Solomon. Chapter four. I want to talk to you about prayer as something more than intercession, even something more than getting grace. But prayer as communion. Song of Solomon, chapter four. Verse seven, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Do you know why you can come into the courts of God? There's only one reason. The blood of the lamb. The lamb. Went to the tree and became a curse of God and his father turned away. And all the wrath of almighty God that should have fallen down on your head throughout all of eternity fell down on the lamb. And when the lamb died, he satisfied justice and appeased the wrath of God. He paid for every one of your sins, past, present and future. They were all imputed to him and he took them away. He paid for them. And now, therefore, there is no condemnation like Esther. Who wanted so much to walk into the throne room, but she had to do so with fear because if the king did not extend the scepter, she would die in Christ to the believer. The scepter is always extended. Always. He always sees you as you are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Now, I want you to understand something, the justification it will really, really help you. You see, you've got to understand this. If there was just one blemish in you, you would go to hell. You see, God doesn't see you as sinful enough to go to hell. And then a little bit better, so sinful enough, but still you can be kept. And better than that, so that you can come a little closer and not quite as many sins, so you can get a little closer and not quite as many sins, so you can get a little closer. You go to hell if you have one blemish in you. Which also must show you that if you are invited into the throne room of God, it's because there are no blemishes in you. That you are altogether lovely, altogether perfect. And that's why you can come to him. Even on that day when you commit sins and the dullness of your heart does not even allow you to see those sins, you are still forgiven and can still come. Yes, there is a need to deal with that sin. But what I want you to see is this. Because of Christ, you are altogether beautiful. There is no blemish in you. And if there were one blemish in you, you could not come. That should give you great encouragement. When God looks down at you. You know, we have this almost mechanical view, you know, this legal view, and it is a legal thing, justification. But we almost have this thing of God, because of what Jesus did, he must accept me now. And that is not the because of what Jesus did. God looks at you and says, you're altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Do you see the passion? Can you see the love that's there? Can you see the desire and the wanting? You see, you can't because you've never seen it in anything else. We live in a conditional world. You meet all the conditions you get in. You fail at some of the conditions you're out. But Christ has met all the conditions. And therefore, when God looks at you, he says, you're altogether beautiful, my darling. And he must see you that way or you go to hell. But he does see you that way because of Christ. And he always sees you that way. His disposition toward you does not change. That is so wonderful what Christ has done for us. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. And there is no blemish in you. That should be the greatest encouragement for you to pray. That should be the greatest encouragement for you to ask God, examine me, O Lord. Show me 
my ways. That should be the greatest encouragement for you to confess your sin, because it is not a judge who comes to you and a judge will never come to you again. Only a father. Only a father. I believe it was Brother Mike uh, Morrow that was telling me about this, that that you're not just justified, you're adopted. You know, when someone goes before a judge and a judge acquits him, the judge then doesn't invite him to go home with him. God's not only justified you, he's adopted you. And he looks at you with such love, with such endearment, with such joy at what he has made possible. That because of the power of the blood of the lamb, when he looks at you, you're altogether beautiful. And there is no blemish. And then he says in verse eight, come. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon, journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Senir and Hermon, from the den of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Come. God is always calling his people to come. And Satan is always telling them, you can't go. Look at you. I mean, how can you go? He knows what you've done. He knows your sins. He knows how vile you are. He knows the dullness of your heart. Don't go to him. But those are the words of the liar and the deceiver. And oftentimes you believe him because it is so hard to believe God with regard to his love because his love is so great. It's like I'm fond of telling people this who doubt the love of God. I always my charismatic friends, they're always telling me that the greatest act of faith is being able to raise the dead. I tell them for Baptists, that's nothing. We do that every Sunday. They say to raise the dead, that man, anybody who can really raise the dead, they've got so much faith. I said, no, that's not the greatest act of faith. Do you want to know what the greatest act of faith is? I'm going to tell you the greatest act of faith for the Christian is to look in the mirror of God's word. And see all their failings. And then to believe by faith that God loves them as much as he says he does. That is faith. Because you have to believe something you've never even seen anywhere else in the world. No one is like God and no one's love is like God's love. When he tells you to come. Don't you know the one who just spoke the word knows everything about you. He knows everything you've done, everything you're going to do. So if he says, come, then the invitation is come. So many believers are constantly staying away from God. Or you've done this, haven't you? You've really blown it. You've really sinned. You're convicted about it, and that's good. You confess it, that's good. And then you realize that you need to stay away from God for several days until you win enough brownie points to get back. That's a lie. He says, come, come, come. One of the most beautiful things in my life was when one day in Peru on the third floor of a house in Mia Flores, I came to believe that God really loved me. All my spot, all my blemishes, all the things I've done that before him, they were removed in Jesus Christ and that he could only love me and would only love me and never stop loving me. And that I did not know enough. I did not know as much about myself as he knew. And yet he still loves me. Jude says this to keep yourself in the love of God. Now, many preachers will turn that around and turn it into legalism. You need to keep loving God. That's not what it means. I don't know anything about plants, but if you told me you had a dying plant and I said, well, let me take a look at it. And I went to your house. You took me to the inner room and the closet of the inner room, which was pitch dark. And you opened the door and there was the plant. I would say to you, well, I don't know much about plants, but I can tell you this. You need to keep that thing out in the sunshine. Because the further you get that thing away from the sunshine, the more it's going to wilt. I'll tell you that, believer. That's your problem. 
You need to keep yourself in the love of God. Now, how do you do that? By faith. How do you do that? The word of God. One of the things that would do, one of the things that would probably help most people in this room right now is to find every verse in the Bible that talks about God's immeasurable, unconditional love. Memorize it and meditate on it until you believe it. Keep yourself. In the recognition, keep recognizing, keep believing that God loves you as much as he says he does, and you'll not fear to come into his presence. He says, come with me, but also look what he says. Journey down. Journey down. We're so full of pride. We're so full of vanity. We're always walking in high places where we don't belong. Vanity fair is where our flesh wants to live. Mesmerized by trinkets and things that sparkle and make noise. Mesmerized with things that don't matter. Worried about clothing and little signs on them. Worried about the kind of car you drive. Worried about whether or not your kid gets to enough soccer games during the week. You spend every bit of your life on that which does not matter. And you end up ruined and broken and distraught and weary. And God is saying, come by from me. Come, come down. Come down from those places that cannot feed you. Come down from those places that can do you no good. And come down from those dangerous haunts. Look what he says. He says, from den of lions and mountains of leopards, come down. Those are dangerous places. Dangerous. Fear is a good thing. You should fear what this world can do to you. You should fear what sin can do to you. You should fear what self can do to you. Come down, get away from it and get away from people who are mesmerized by it. He said, well, I want to be with them to save them. Save your own self now. Get away. Walk with people. People who have eyes that are not evil, that are not full of darkness. People who are always directing you towards eternal things. The problem is that's the way the church is supposed to be, but because gospel is so weak and no church discipline is practiced, the church is filled up with wicked people who love wicked things. And it's hard to find anyone in the church will direct you towards something eternal. It's almost as though in Wesley and Whitfield's day when you got to go within the church and make a holy club. Come down from those things. Don't you know that inside you in your flesh? Your flesh has the keenest ability to make an idol out of absolutely anything. Your flesh can take the Bible and use it. And create an idol out of knowledge. Create an idol out of ministry. Create an idol out of almost anything. Even that which is good and holy and right. He says, come down. And look at this in verse nine. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. Now, if that won't get you praying, I don't know what will. What does that tell me? I go like this. And you can hear the divine heart beat faster with a single glance of my eyes. Guys, you remember when those of you who are married, your spouse before you married her, she just kind of cut her eyes over at you while you're sitting there in church. From across the room, and you felt like you're just going to faint right over. Remember that? Well, you ought to remember it. What's wrong with you? You ought to still have it. She looks at you and like. That 
to just the, it was the, the power of that. It's spoken of in a, as a dangerous thing when it's a foreign woman. But when it's the woman God has for you and she cuts those eyes at you and your heart falls out on the floor and rolls down to the aisle, down to the front of the church. Man, that's a good thing. The power of it. God loves us so much. Just a glance of our eyes upward in prayer. His heart beats faster. His heart beats faster. I'll never forget after my little boy Ian was born. I had a very difficult childhood, to say the least. And but when my little boy was born, I'll never forget. He was old enough, finally got the point where he could smile and hug and lift his arms up in the air. And I'll never forget. He was laying there on our bed upstairs and I walked around the corner and came into the room. And when he saw me, you got to understand, my boy could have a heart attack. He gets so excited looking at a blank wall. But (laughs) he he looked at me and the moment he looked at me, he went. There was not one doubt in that little boy's mind that his father was going to run over there, grab him, pick him up and hug him. There was not one doubt. I mean, you talk about self-esteem or self. He had no doubt that he was loved. He knew he just had to cut those eyes at me. And I was a goner. Oh, gosh, I hope my wife doesn't give birth to a girl. I'll be dead. But what I want you to see is how do you think those things happen? Do you think that they come out of creation or they're birthed out of human nature? Why do those things even exist in creation? Have you ever wondered about that? God put them there. And why did he put them there to tell you about him? How can you love a child? How could you dare think that you love a child more than God loves you? You can't even begin to understand one look upward. He said, oh, brother Paul, you don't understand. Son, you don't understand how powerful is the blood of Jesus Christ. This one glance. See, the fear of the Lord, you have to understand this. A little boy can fear his father because one day he runs to his father with a picture he drew and says, look, dad. And his dad grabs the picture. And uh, says, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. And the little boy goes on, plays, everything's happy. Next day, the little boy comes, same dad, same different picture, gives it to his dad. His dad's in a terrible mood. He grabs the picture, slaps the boy around and sends him across the room. The little boy trembles. Why? He fears his dad. Why? Because of the inconsistencies in his father's character. That doesn't happen with your heavenly father. His character is set in perfection. Because of the work of Christ, he cannot love you more, will not love you less. One glance of your eyes. You've got him. You've got him. You've got him. One glance of your eyes and his heart beats faster. Look what he says. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. Now, look at this with a single strand of your necklace. Let me ask you this. Where'd she get the necklace? She got it from him. You see, all that beauty you've got, it's a gift. You see, your elder brother, he's not like Joseph. He's one greater than Joseph. Joseph had a coat of many colors that he would not share with his brothers. But our Joseph, our Jesus, has a coat of many colors, a righteousness upon him that is is his own by his own doing. And he gives it to you. You see, he looks down at you and sees no spot, no blemish. He sees these beautiful adornments hanging all off of you. They're the very things he gave you. It's what grace is all about. And it's so wonderful, so wonderful that he has saved you and not only cleaned you, he's dressed you up with his own grace. And every time he looks at you, 
This is what he sees. You say, well, Brother Paul, now hold on for a second. What about all the sin? You know, Brother Paul, there's just as much, you know, adultery in the church as outside of the church. And there's just as much lying and cheating and stealing and fornication and pornography and everything in the church as outside of the church. Because that's what our evangelical leaders tell us. That's a lie. That is a lie. There is not as much pornography, fornication, adultery, lying, cheating and immorality in the church as outside of the church. Your problem is you don't know what the church is. The church is not made up of all the people who are going to gather together tomorrow morning. No, the church is not perfect, but she is being perfected and sanctified. And he who began a good work in her will finish it. And he guards her zealously and the spirit that is within her guards her zealously. And he disciplines her zealously because he loves her zealously. I'll tell you what, a lot of men are going to have to answer for what they've called the church of Jesus Christ. They've looked at a bunch of unconverted, lost, carnal people who happen to be members of the church and identified them with the church. And in so blasphemed their God by talking so harshly against his bride, his bride's beautiful. She's not perfect, but she's broken and she's walking and she's growing and she's changing and he's making something of her. So he says, how beautiful is your love in verse 10. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine. Now, I want you to look at something. I find it very hard sometimes when everyone is singing, oh, how I love Jesus. I find it very hard to sing along. I do. I look at my love and I don't see a whole lot worth singing about, to be honest with you. I look at a heart that's sometimes cold. I'd rather sing, oh, how Jesus loves me than oh, how I love Jesus. And in a sense, that's very, very good. But we have to be very careful here. Because look what it says. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. Brother Mike, again this morning, was talking to me about the how the high priest sanctifies our holy things. Jesus shared that with me this morning. Fits right in here. Our priest, our mediator, our intercessor, our Christ, our captain, the man before God for us. Seems that he sanctifies and makes holy all our offerings to God. Even that love that is so dull And so impure. And it passes through him. It is lovely. Don't you see, saints, what he's done for you? He's done so much. He's done it all. He doeth all things well. He's left not one part out. So he says, How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices? I want to drop down. I'd like to preach through all of this. But look at verse 12. A a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a garden locked, a spring sealed up. Now, what does this mean? She's chase. She's a garden locked up. I tell young ladies that I that I teach when I'm teaching university students and such. I said, this is the text for you. And for young men, it's the same. You should be a garden locked up. Young people, today have got the idea that they're sexually pure if they've never had intercourse, if they've had everything else. No, to be chased is to be a garden locked up. No one's touched the fruit, much less tasted it. No one's even looked at it. It's a garden shut up. And in the same way, the church of Jesus Christ, we should be a garden shut up, a garden locked up. Close our doors to all other lovers. They only want to hurt us anyways. They only want to tear at us like wolves and lions. And for those of you who are pastors out there, let me let let me tell you something. Learn this. Your number one job as a pastor. God has entrusted his bride to you. You protect her. You protect her. 
That's what's wrong with church growth. That's what's wrong with dropping the bar to get as many people in as possible. That's what's wrong with not practicing church discipline. Your main job is to protect the bride of Jesus Christ and to present her before him a pure and a chaste virgin. You can't make a bride. He makes it. So stop trying to make one and start doing your work of protecting her and feeding her and guarding her and loving her and presenting her one day before him. But look at this. This is the way we're supposed to be, church. You have been invited to have communion with the living God. Why would you seek to other things? Why would you seek to give your wares to other things, to give your, your very being to other things? Close yourself off from everything else and give yourself to him, to Christ alone, to God alone. It's wonderful. Give me give me a young man who is shut up. So many men, so many young men, they're all about fellowship and group hugs and getting together and singing Kumbaya and trying to look radical. Give me a man who'll break away from all of them, shut himself up to God. A friend of mine was talking to Leonard Ravenhill one day and he told Brother Ravenhill, he says, Brother Paul Washer, a friend, dear friend of mine, is really going through some struggles and some terrible times. And Leonard Ravenhill sent me a little track. It's got written on Brother Paul. And the track is others can, but you cannot. And what it says is simply this. OK, let everybody else go walk through the mall all day long. Let everybody else watch television. Yeah, let everybody else go to some silly Christian concert. God's not in. Let everybody else go on Christian retreats and ski trips. But if you really want to be God's man, they can, but you cannot. When I was called into the ministry, I went and told my pastor in Texas and a very, 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 very used man of God. And he looked at me and the first thing he said is, can, boy, can you be alone? And I thought he meant that if I preached the truth, I would be alone. That's not what he meant. What he meant was, can you break away from the rest of these boys and go seek God? Can you shut yourself up to him? We can spend time learning how to crochet. We can spend time sitting in a tree stand. You can spend time on a golf course. You can spend time fellowshipping and eating donuts and doing everything. But why is it so hard to spend time to shut yourself up to the one who loves you most? It does show that although we have been thoroughly redeemed, there is an aspect of us called the flesh that has not been redeemed. Now, I want to skip through that and I just want to go quickly to 16. The bride is speaking and she says, awake, O north wind and come wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eats its choice fruit. Now, here's a, a young lady who has done all this work, all this preparation, and there's only one reason for it. Her only desire is that the wind will come and blow the fragrance of what she's done to the one that she's loved. And that he, getting a whiff of that fragrance, would come in and take from her the gifts she has prepared. It's her greatest desire. I remember when I was like this. I remember first saved. Hopefully you remember the same. The only thing you wanted was his eye. The only thing you wanted was his attention. You pray, read the word. Be half crazy most of the time. Overzealous, wild, no theology, no anything. But the only thing you wanted, you go out soul winning, knocking on doors, read your Bible, stand upside down on your head and quote the yeah, Westminster Confession. Anything it would take. Just, oh, Lord, look at me. Oh, Lord, be with me. Lord, do anything to have you. Lord, just come into this room. Don't leave me this way. Take my life, but give me your presence. Is he looking? Is he looking? 
Do you remember when you were that way? And then it says in verse one of chapter five, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my mirth along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Verse 